<clears throat> Welcome Tagorong Salvos and others who've come to uh, watch this clip this day. God bless you. Our guest today is Commissioner Lynn Pierce, who's a retired Salvation Army officer who has served uh, God for 39 years in active service and uh, even beyond that in retirement has been actively serving God uh, for a, a further decade or so. And that's right, isn't it, Lynn? That is correct. Well, it's lovely to have you with us. Welcome. And uh, we're here today, uh, amongst other things, to bring glory and honour to God. We're going to uh, talk about your autobiography, which has just been released uh, in the last uh, few months, middle of the year, this year, 2021, called Amazed. And it is very true that the life that uh, uh, Commissioner Lynn has lived is truly amazing. And uh, she acknowledges that this is God's, God's will for her. God's will worked out through her. And we'll come to that towards the end of our session today. So not so long ago you wrote this uh, beautiful book. It's uh, Amazed. Uh, the autobiography has been dedicated to your family and, and your friends who have been incredibly important to you over the years, and still are, and they've been very supportive and uh, the book is really full of love. It captures, if you get to read the book, and I encourage you to do so, it captures a great sense of love right from the early stages in your family. And throughout the book, you can see God's hand on Lynn, which is amazing, and she will share that with us in due course. So today we're going to trace some of Lynn's footsteps as her journey took her from an isolated little village, a little farming community, 37 kilometres east of Parks, which some say is the centre of the universe. Centre of the universe, that's Parks. Right. There we go. Uh, and that's, and from there we're going to go to a kaleidoscope of countries and teaching ministries that you've fulfilled around the world. That's amazing. Mm. Mm. Um, I enjoyed your book, Lynn, and uh, I commend it to everybody. And it's you've lived and continue to live an amazing life. And uh, with you, we thank God for what has been achieved. And uh, how can people obtain a copy of this book? Well, I have uh, some to give away. So. Right. I'll bring them along here, and if anybody really wants one, they yep. can just let me know, and okay. I'll, I'll get it to them. So that will be, you'll be easily contactable one way yes, or another? Yes, and, and once they run out, that's, that's it. it. Yes. Right, mm. okay, right. And are you prepared to write something in the cover for people? If oh, they yes, ask? if they want, yes. There you go, mm -hmm. beautiful. Now, as I read this book in my mind, it occurred to me that there seemed to be at least two things that were a, a constant blessing in your life. I'm not saying that there were, that, that was all, but for me there was two very grand things that were a constant blessing in your life. Firstly, that you had an inquisitive mind and nature and you nurtured that characteristic. It was always with you. And uh, secondly, that er at every turn in your life it appeared that you took comfort and confidence even when you were not confident. You took confidence in being in God's company at every turn. And I suggest that your prayer life is crucially uh, intertwined in all of that. Would that be right? What did you think of that? Yes, that's correct. And uh, I, al I always was very inquisitive and questioning about everything actually and uh, wanted to understand and get my mind around everything, the way God created the world and uh, his plans for us and just faith in general. And uh, yeah, so that was part of it. And uh, I began a journey of prayer, I guess, uh, probably around high school. Yeah. Mm. You speak in your book about uh uh, having prayer at the table, uh, oh, yes. meal tables, yes, that's and right. and mm. uh, devotions, and and that was that was important, but it, not uh, not as much as when you went to high school. Just, well, we we just we had grace right. at every meal. Yes, that's it. Right, and uh, yes, yeah. so and we all sat together for every meal yeah. at the farm. So yeah, very good. Now, in your primary school years, you attended a very small country school, one would understand, mm -hmm. and uh, 
You had it in your heart to be a teacher yourself. And you eventually discovered that not every teacher was as competent as they ought to be. Is that right? Uh, that is certainly true. I always wanted to be a teacher even before I set foot in the school. Right. So, so I don't know why that was. Mm, so engaging with the school teachers and, and the other kids, but predominantly the school teachers. Did that fuel your ambitions for uh, school teaching, for teaching perhaps, or, or not? No, I don't think it did affect uh, that. I just, it was just something I wanted to do regardless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. very good. So when you eventually started, we're going to skip primary school. Yes, good. And uh, we're going to go straight to high school, you know, the dreams of every youth at school. <laughs> when you eventually started high school, and, uh, and you had to board with your grandparents in parks during mm -hmm. the school week. That's so right. you lived at home on the weekends at the, on the farm. Yes. And uh, had to catch a train. Yes. Backwards and forwards, yes. Um, what was one of the most important parts of your routine in parks during your high school years with your grandparents? What was one of the most influential elements to that, a routine that you can recall? Well, every... Every night after the evening meal, uh, my grandparents, uh, mostly my grandmother actually, read a chapter from the Bible. And some of the chapters actually were very long. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but anyway, she read that and then prayed. And uh, I remember she always prayed that verse from Isaiah, I think it's 55, 11, about God's word not returning to us void, yes. but that it will accomplish uh, what he wants. Yes. And she repeated that verse, I think, every night in her prayer. Uh, and it sort of stays in your mind, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. So that was something in her, her own heart. Oh, yes. She was hopeful to transfer to a young, a young mind, a young spiritual being. Yeah. Well... I think it was just part of her life, you yes. know, part of the way she, yeah. she was. Mm. Very good. So you attended a little community church mm. uh, in, with your grandfather, uh, that your grandfather and uncle built, is that right? Great uncle, yes. Great uncle. That's right. Right. Mm. And your family were people with a strong Christian faith. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Methodists. Yes. And, and the system was back then that uh, someone would come in, a minister would ride into town, into the little village and conduct a service one Sunday and then the next Sunday would be a different denomination, is that right? That's right and it, wa it wasn't a village, all mm. you had was Just the church community. and next door was the tennis court and cricket ground, right. that was it. Right. And, but you had the first Sunday of the month a Presbyterian minister came to the little church mm. and the second Sunday Methodist and the third Sunday Anglican and the fourth Sunday we had off. Right. <laughs> Very good. So that would have been, uh, well, it's all about uh, nurturing one's faith. And I think it's just wonderful. Is the little church still there today? It's still there. Yeah. And they have, I think, a service once a month. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and the key is still in the same place. Yeah. So if you're out there, you know where to find the key and have yeah. a look inside. Isn't that a mar marvellous yeah. thing? I know that uh, in Australia and many other countries, there's lots of, some families... With, with a heritage that goes right back and they can identify an old church that a relative built and it's all very foundational. Very good. Mm. So um, you attended that church and uh, I understand from the book that uh, you appear to be a reluctant salvo. So we're just skipping forward a bit. Mm. A reluctant salvo. Can you tell us the story of how God spoke to you about becoming a salvationist, please? Well, I, I suggest you read the book because it's Fair a enough. fairly long story mm -hmm. and it's like a jigsaw puzzle with, you know, piece after piece. But I do remember one uh, Saturday night we'd driven in from the farm to go to the local picture theatre and this was a great So you went to the pictures when oh, you were youth? Oh, yes, yes. Went to the pictures when she was young. Yes. Okay, just and putting that out there. <laughs> and... Uh, we were driving up the main street and the, the local Salvation Army Corps, which was fairly small, but they were there having an open air meeting. And I just sensed the Lord saying to me, now that is where you belong. Mm. 
It was just another little piece in the jigsaw yeah. of the Lord calling me into the Salvation yeah. Army. Mm. And that is in your book, and I, yeah. I agree, it's like a jigsaw, mm. but all the pieces come together, and that's what's amazing, God's mm. hand in Lynn's life in, in all the time in so many ways. Now, I noticed when you graduated into high school, mm. Your primary school didn't manage to pass on any academic records. That's right. So the problem for the high school was how to grade Lynn Pierce. Is she an A student or a B student or a D student? Sorry, did I miss one? That's how bad a student I am. But what grade were you placed into and how do you think this was determined? Well, I don't. I really have no idea how they worked it out, but they put me in the B class. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that meant instead of doing languages, uh, as you would in the A class, I did business principles and bookkeeping. Uh, but also, uh, math, maths one and two I also did, which was very important. So, yes. Mm. And it's interesting in your book because you do mention that, that the B class, you had less choice about subjects. Mm. And there was that less than favourite subject of yours, which was, as you said, the, the bookkeeping and business principles. Mm. You really wouldn't have chosen that for yourself, but it was a compulsory B subject. Is that yeah, right? That's... Fair enough. How was this subject, a subject that was not of your choosing, how was this subject a benefit to you in your future teaching career? Well, when in my first appointment as a Salvation Army officer, uh, I was appointed to Kalimna, which was uh, the place for, it was like for delinquents, but you're not supposed to call them that now, uh, girls who'd been committed by the courts yes, yes. Uh, to the care and control of the Salvation Army. And I had to run the school. And one of the subjects that the girls were doing was business principles and bookkeeping. Uh, and so, I mean, I was able to help them, of course, and guide them. And they were doing it as a correspondence course, but they were still in the school classroom and you had to te help teach them and guide them. So it was quite miraculous, really. Yeah. You know, otherwise I would not have had a clue yeah. what to do. Yeah. And that's that jigsaw, isn't it? Mm. The pieces mm, that's coming right. together and building this amazing... Uh, ministry that has been lens over the years. Moving on into the 70s, 70, 70, 72, mm -hmm. you studied with other cadets in the Salvation Army Training College in Sydney. Yes, at and, Petersham. And uh, yes. you at Petersham. Mm -hmm. that big, uh, the yeah. facade is still there today, that massive mm -hmm. uh, castle like fortress. Thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're part of the victorious session. That's right. Very good. Yes. And we would expect uh, people watching the, the clip today who've been involved in that session and might have said a hallelujah they in the might, lounge yes. room, we would encourage that. <laughs> but you were trained to be a minister of the gospel, mm. a Salvation Army officer. Mm. So can you tell us a little bit about what that was like to train in those days in the 70s? Well, in lots of ways, it was marvellous and uh, I was so hungry to learn about the word and uh, just all the teaching that was given because I hardly had any background in uh, biblical studies or anything like that, you know. And uh, But on the other hand, it was very challenging because the, the, it was very strict mm. and, you know, you... Yes. Everybody would have been assigned duties and... Um, oh, yes. You were on cleaning duties yeah. every morning yeah. and... You had to wear your uniform all the time, even when you went out. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. There's stories about you getting, uh, doing things to hide the fact that you were not quite in uniform when you went out. Well, but we don't have to Well, there those. are a number of those stories, yeah. and some I didn't put in the book. But, right. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. yes, you had to be very creative sometimes. Yes, mm. to go out and... Let your hair down, so to speak. That's right. Very exactly. good. Read the book. It's a good book to read. So soon after you were commissioned, mm. there was a corps where you served as both a trainer and uh, of cadets and a corps leader, mm. I think. And uh, there's a lovely story in your book 
about that time about how Jim downstairs, now there was a gym downstairs and a gym upstairs in right. where they lived, okay. Mm. You, you, you could, could you tell us a, this great story about how Jim downstairs met Jesus mm. and how his life was immediately turned around, mm. please? Well, Jim downstairs and Jim upstairs, they lived, they just had a room to live in. Mm. And uh, there was sort of, I think, one bathroom on each floor and everything they owned was in that room. Jim upstairs was married. Uh, to Val and she she was addicted to Valium and Jim upstairs was an alcoholic and Jim downstairs was an alcoholic. But they used to come along to the meetings at Glee and uh, we sort of loved them, you know, and tried to do everything we could to help them understand the gospel and, and miraculously Jim downstairs did get converted mm really converted and uh, his life just changed and he said one day even going out to get a newspaper now is an exciting thing for me mm -hmm. but he, he his the transformation was wonderful mm -hmm. and we even he didn't have any teeth actually and uh, <coughs> we even uh, managed to uh, arrange for him to get a set of teeth but uh, what happened was that when he had a meal, he had to take his teeth out. Oh. <laughs> he preferred to eat with his teeth out. Yeah. Yes, he yeah. found it easy. Yeah. And then he put them in again <coughs> after the meal was over. Mm. Uh, what's wonderful about that story is that uh, my understanding is that you really did love people mm. into the kingdom. There's none of this, uh, you know, uh, grab the Bible and, and preach heavily to them mm. or teach heavily. It really is, it seems to me, the most effective way was to just be Jesus to people. Mm -hmm. Hold their hands or just embrace them in Christ and, and lead them into a better life. And, mm -hmm. and that comes to many people through the acceptance of Jesus Christ as Saviour. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> quite early in your officership, you experienced uh, learning opportunities that formed your life of prayer even more. Uh, attending a Brangle Institute for, is one example. Now that's a, that's a, a, a gathering of uh, uh, believers who st deeply study holiness right? and, and holy living. Mm. And uh, how would you summarise your early discoveries about prayer, given that I think that attending a Brangle was, was, was good for you in that way? Well, it was the, the teaching of... Uh Lieutenant Colonel Minor Russell, actually, who an American officer retired, <coughs> who was a guest at that Brengel Institute, and she was teaching on prayer. And she also did a series at the training college where I was on the staff. And uh, her teaching just transformed my own thinking about prayer. And it, it really was wonderful. And the way she talked about the love of God and our own relationship with God. And it, so it meant the prayer moved from being a sense of something I was supposed to do to something uh, that was part of this loving relationship with God. Mm. Mm. I can remember you doing some teaching in, in this division many, many years ago well, and on prayer and it was very, uh, very effective and timely for, for lots of us who attended and that was a last century, Lynn? Last century. Last oh, century. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> now it seems to me that uh, the smouldering coals within you for prayer and sharing prayer with others and having others pray for you as well had been fanned and had burst into a sort of a flame within you. And so much so that your experience and insights of prayer became a much needed message for many. And your life and ministry was punctuated by wonderful opportunities around the world to teach other pilgrims about prayer. What a, what a wonderful privilege. And so many people touched by that then. What would, what would be a few choice words about, about prayer 
that you'd like to share with people today? Uh, yeah, <coughs> well firstly, I, I mean, I call the book amazed, but I am amazed at the opportunities that God opened up uh, for helping people in their journey for prayer. But I would say that prayer is all about developing our love relationship with God. That is the very essence of it, the, the relationship. Not something I feel is my duty or, you know, or feel guilty about. So many people feel they, they're no good at praying. And, well, probably none of us is any good no, at, at no, praying. No. But to help people beyond that sense of feeling they're no good at it and having guilt about whether they don't pray enough. Uh, just to help people move from that to see that uh, it's about this loving relationship with God. And then flowing from that, loving relationships with others and, you know, forgiving others and that sort of thing. What was the other part of your question? The other part was just a few choice words about prayer itself. Oh, Some yes. Some good counsel. Yes. Well, that first thing, that prayer is about developing our love relationship mm. with God. The second thing, I think, is realising that uh, it's about our absolute dependence upon God. Mm. Uh, not, you know, making all our plans and then saying, Lord, bless, bless yeah, us. Yeah. But our absolute dependence upon God in what we might do and, yeah. and how we might approach a, a situation and all of that sort yeah. of thing. Mm. That's a good that's good advice. Mm. Just depend upon depend upon God mm. for for where He wants us placed going mm. forward. And I would say too, if I can I say another Absolutely. Word? <laughs> Absolutely. I've been reading Joshua <coughs> in my uh, own sort of time with the Lord at home. And it's interesting that in the beginning of Joshua, uh, he says, we haven't been this way before. Mm. And I think at this very time in, in history, we haven't been this way before. We're coming out of a double lockdown, yeah. you know, the pandemic. And, uh, so, and in Joshua, they had the Ark of the Covenant before them which represented the presence and the power of God. Mm. And I think uh, as we emerge from this uh, period in our own lives, that we need to just reflect on Joshua and yep. the way they move forward yep. with the Ark of the Covenant, the presence and the power of God just Going ahead. First and foremost. No. Mm. Very good. That's very good and timely. Thanks, Lynn. Bless you. As I said in the beginning, it seems that every step along the way of your life's journey, God is with you. Mm. And now we know that uh, life's not always an easy journey, physically and spiritually. And, and there are times when you, you too have faced discouragement. There are a few good stories about how people in the church can very quickly discourage their leaders. That's in the book as well. But um, nevertheless, there's a lovely account in your book of God bringing words and music into your life just at the right time to bring you a sense of peace. You were burdened. You'd come home from um, uh, your appointment. Or THQ. THQ appointment. Mm -hmm. Burdened by some of the things that uh, you had to deal with because of your, your appointment. Um, and uh, I guess that in your mind, suddenly God made you aware that there was something, a message coming to you. Would that be right? From the unit downstairs? Yes, that's right. I, I was assistant secretary for personnel at the time right. in Sydney. Yeah. And uh, there'd been a run of very sad, difficult situations. And uh, there was one in particular that had come on that day. And I went home so burdened and I thought I can't do this any longer. Mm -hmm. And I was just sitting on the edge of the lounge with my head in my hands saying, oh God, oh God. And then underneath, 
the flat underneath, they started singing something, Koreans, mm. and they were singing the chorus, uh, but I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed under him against that day. And uh, those of us who have a few years under our belt would recognise that chorus. Yes. And it's uh, straight out of scripture, out mm. of uh, 1 or 2 Timothy. And mm. um, they sang it and sang it. Mm. And as they sang, I found the burden just lifting. And, and they I, sang in Korean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I think that's throughout the book. There are those times when, when I just absorbed the reality that we've all got, uh, we're all a bit of like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm. And then sometimes we're not quite fitting in the way we thought we ought. Yeah. And those are the times when maybe we are on, on the sh sofa with our hands in our heads wondering what's, what's to happen. Mm. And uh, that's another example that God is with you and God mm. is with us all. Have you any comments just to close off? I'm just going to say a paragraph, but uh, have you got any other comments you want to share with us uh, um, about the book or witness? Uh, just that I, I suppose I felt the Lord prompting me for some time to put down something. And also, I thought it would help the family. I'm the only salvationist in the family. And I thought it would give greater understanding to yeah. them about... Uh, you know, what I've been doing all these years. Yeah. Uh, so I it's really just wanted to write it and give it as a gift to the Lord. Yeah. And if it's of some help to somebody, well, that, that's great. And if it brings encouragement, yeah. you know, to somebody or causes somebody to think about what is it that God wants me to do the rest of my life? Yeah. Then that that would be wonderful, but that's that's all in the hands of God. Exactly. How we might, you know, yeah. take it and use it. But I must say, I am amazed. Just the way the Lord has led me in my life. You know, you'd grow up in the bush, and <laughs> you're not a member of the Salvation Army or anything, and but you end up there. So mm. amazed. Amazing. Mm. Well, in closing off this morning, uh, we delight in taking time to acknowledge the presence of God with us and to give thanks for the power, knowledge, insight and endurance which comes to believers when they depend upon God. So Lynn, you are a very gracious Christian leader and influencer and you've shared the secrets of uh, your wonderful life with us in your book, Amazed. And just to finish, I'm going to uh, read out two quotes. These are, these are just powerful statements on their own. I just, Lynn writes, I just had to depend totally on God and continue to seek prayer support from faithful friends. Prayer is such a strong support influencer yeah and we should take that to heart today and the other thing I want to say something that's in your book a quote uh, and I, something I mentioned right at the beginning and that is God's will is worked out in a person rather than in a place God's will is worked out in a person rather than in a place and let's be those people. Let's be the people who allow God to work in us that we might be clearly defined by Him, by him and the fruit of the Spirit. So with that, thanks again Lynn for being willing to be involved in this way. We, we love your book. We wish that well. A great message. Let's share a prayer together. Dear Father God, we want to thank you for this day and the blessings that are ours as, as your children. Our prayer from the very depths of our heart is that we might have more and more, many more adopted brothers and sisters just as we have been adopted into your family. We pray for Lynn and her witness and give thanks, Almighty God, that you have
put this beautiful jigsaw together in so it in a marvelous way uh, a kaleidoscope of events and ministry and all linked so beautifully because because your will has been worked out through Lynn. And so we bow before your almighty God and seek that kind of wisdom in our own life, that kind of spirit in our own lives that we too might look back and be amazed at what you have done through us because of our willingness to have your will worked out through our, our lives and our being. Be with our loved ones and friends, be with our ministries that they be... Uh, that they flourish for your kingdom's sake. Amen. Amen.